on behalf of the Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Studies, I would like to welcome you to this evening. For those of you who are new to the Santa Barbara Institute, Dr. Wallace is a renowned um, scholar, and he's also the president and founder of the Santa Barbara Institute. Uh, he's a highly regarded meditation teacher, and he's studied with uh, many great lamas, uh, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, and Gyaltro Rinpoche. Uh, he holds an undergraduate degree in physics from Amherst, and he also has a doctorate in religious studies from Stanford University. Dr. Wallace is a leading edge pioneer in the interface of the classical contemplative traditions of Buddhism and the breakthrough insights of contemporary physics. Tonight, he will be speaking to us on the conscious universe where Buddhism and physics converge. Please welcome Dr. Wallace. Good evening. I'm glad to join you tonight and have the opportunity to speak on really one of my favorite topics. After having been a monk for many years, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, living with Tibetans a lot of that time in India, when after 14 years' leave of absence from Western civilization, decided to come back and try to integrate what I learned from the Tibetans with the Tibetans with my Western background, uh, I made a beeline for physics. And that was at Amherst College when I was, what, 34 years old, decided to finish my undergraduate education. And so this was my first venturing back into the field of science. It was in physics. Since then, a lot of work with neuroscientists, psychologists, and so forth. But I'm coming back to physics again, kind of a re renewed love affair. The topic for tonight is one that I think should very properly arouse a strong sense of skepticism, where Buddhism and physics converge. How could they possibly converge? And that is, if you look at the methodologies, how do Buddhists, traditional Buddhists, Buddhist monks, yogis, and so forth, how are they inquiring into the nature of reality, primarily by way of meditation? And the primary emphasis of that is looking into the very nature of awareness itself. Not exclusively, but that's certainly a central theme. So we have yogis living in caves in the Himalayas, or in little grass huts in India 1,500 years ago, meditating, allegedly making discoveries. But in terms of sheer methodology, also a contemplative methodology. And then we have physicists going back to the time of Galileo. What, where are they directing their attention? Not to their minds at all. They're directing their attention entirely outwards, and moreover, they're directing their attention outwards by way of increasingly sophisticated technology. Galileo with his 20-power telescope, right onto the Hubble telescope. Tibetans had nothing like that. The ancient Indians had nothing remotely like that. And then this marvelous quantitative analysis that is characteristic of all branches of physics. Buddhists don't have any of that. So how could there possibly be any convergence? The methodologies are so different. Just for starters, and then we take Buddhism. A lot of people, especially people who don't understand Buddhism particularly well, regard Buddhism rather generically as a religion. Physics is just a paradigm of science so again, people approaching their understanding of reality by way of religion, that pretty much always entails some appeal to authority. Buddha or God or Jesus or Muhammad, but somebody who really knows what's going on, and then we take their word for it. The physicists are doing just the opposite, aren't they? They're appealing to nature. And if you want to get a Nobel Prize in physics, refute your mentor. Refute, find the highest mountain behind you, whether it's... Whether it's Newton, whether it's Maxwell, whether it's Max Planck, whether it's Einstein, if you can refute them and do it in a compelling fashion, oh, bully for you. You get a Nobel Prize. You don't too, hear too many Buddhists getting a Nobel Prize for refuting the Buddha. <laughs> and so how people following something that certainly, has, it certainly walks like a duck and quacks like a duck in some respects, Buddhism certainly looks in some respects like a religion. Physics is clearly a science. How could there be any convergence that's not just smoke and mirrors? So shall we stop there? <laughs> I'm inviting you to be skeptical. And in terms of presenting my case, that there is in fact at least a possible, meaningful convergence 
the power of what I'll be presenting, if there is any power to it at all, will not be the power of just sheer reasoning that you'll go out of there or that I anticipate or even hope that you'll go out of here thinking, by gum, he's right. Everything he said was so compellingly argued, it must be right. I don't think so. What I am suggesting is that there are avenues of empirical inquiry that may give rise to empirical insights that may suggest a profound convergence. So this is not just an exercise in philosophy. This is an opening of a strategy for combining, integrating methodologies from physics and Buddhism and seeing where that might take us. But I want to step back because I love history. So I'm sorry, you have to take a little dose of history. The dose of history there here is to pinpoint or focus especially on a mindset, above all a mindset, that was a tremendous impediment to scientific inquiry and scientific discovery. If I give just one quintessential phrase, it's from the American historian Daniel Burston, the greatest impediment to discovery is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. It's thinking we know something and we don't. But since we think we know it, we feel that there's no reason to question it. That's the greatest impediment. Ignorance is sweet. Not that I would aspire for it. I have as much as I can handle already. But ignorance is innocent. Ignorance is clean. Just coming out and saying, I don't know. That's not an impediment. That's just being honest. How could that possibly be an impediment? That's clean. But the illusion of knowledge can be very problematic. If we go back to the time of Galileo, and we see what was he resisting, and Francis Bacon resisting, and René Descartes. What were they resisting? What are they rebelling against? It was this medieval, medieval scholasticism that dominated European th- thinking for a few centuries. And it had a very clear-cut hierarchy. And that is, above all, we will bow, we will submit to divine revelation, supernatural revelation. God's own words, by way of the prophets, by way of Jesus, by way of the church councils, which are believed to be blessed by, guided by the Holy Spirit, by God's guiding hand. That trumps everything in this medieval picture. But of course, in this medieval scholasticism, what they did, especially Thomas Aquinas, was taking biblical theology, centuries of biblical theology, fusing that with a stroke of extraordinary brilliance, fusing biblical, Christian biblical theology with Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotelian reason, Aristotelian physics, and so forth. But here is the, the famous phrase, philosophy is the handmaiden of theology. Reason is subservient to divine revelation. In the final analysis, if you want to be saved, you're not going to get there by thinking really smart thoughts. You're going to get there by submitting to, bowing to, accepting Grace accepting divine authority, which transcends the limits of your reasoning, quite possibly, and certainly transcends the limit of your experience. So reason is there to illuminate, to clarify what we know to be true, or at least have an illusion of knowing to be true, namely divine revelation. And then finally, there's just experience. And that is, what do we actually perceive of the world, whether of the world around us or in the Cartesian sense, if if we apply introspection, start observing our own minds, what do we observe when we do so? Experience has to be in conformity with reason, the reason in conformity with revelation. The Bible does not need to conform to Aristotle. Aristotle needed to conform to the Bible. People's experience needed to conform to medieval scholasticism, and if they had experiences that did not, they didn't count. There were type of experiences that didn't count because they couldn't possibly be true because they were not congruent with or in accordance with divine revelation and the reasoning that backed that up. So there was a certain mindset, and Galileo challenged that, saying that in terms of the supernatural realm, the nature of God, the Trinity, heaven and hell, the nature, Jesus' is divinity, we leave that to you. We leave all those supernatural themes to the theologians. You trump everybody. We grant you that. But they were, he was coming in for turf. It was a turf war. That's why he was imprisoned, got house imprisonment. It was a turf war. It wasn't just that he discovered craters on the moon or, or, or spots on the sun. It was that he was demanding of the church 
there's a domain where we will not simply acquiesce to whatever you say, and that is the physical universe. And we will observe it. We will make our observations. And if they are incompatible with Aristotelian thought, assertions, assumptions, so much the worse for Aristotle. And if something contradicts a literal reading of the Bible, well, then you just better think about the Bible again and interpret it differently. When you are in charge of all the turf, you don't really want an interloper coming in and telling you, by the way, we're going to just take the physical universe, if you don't mind. You say, well, we, we, we kind of like the physical universe. We like this unified picture where everything is under one umbrella and we're calling all the shots. He said, uh-uh, and they said, uh-huh, he went to prison. <laughs> Bigger guns. What I'm suggesting here is that we are right now in the midst of a similar type of hierarchy. Clearly, medieval scholasticism is ancient history. We look at it as a historical curiosity as we pick apart Aristotle, and most of us pick apart any kind of absolutely literal reading of the Bible, the 7,000-year-old universe and all of that. But now we have, instead of supernatural revelation, we have nature itself is the final arbiter. Nature decides what is absolutely true, natural revelation, and absolutely not supernatural revelation. In science, if you at any point in biology, chemistry, cosmology, geology, say, oh, and by the way, this is true because it says so in the Quran, or in the Bhagavad Gita, or in the Dhammapada, or what have you, well, you just counted yourself out of the scientific community in that breath You've just excommunicated yourself. The only arbiter is what nature reveals to us. Nature reveals, and then we apply our reasoning, especially in modern science, quantitative reasoning. Let us make sense of it. Let us, if we can, identify the mathematical laws of nature that are gained through reasoning, sifted from, by process of induction, sifted from the data, the appearances, the revelations that nature herself presents to us. Reason will sift that out. And then finally there's experience. I'm putting it at the bottom again. You might find that quite odd. But once again, what type of experience counts? I've read the magazine The Skeptic, which is one of, in some respects, one of the most dogmatic journals I've ever met, read. And very clearly, they'll come back and say, your experience, well, your experience, if you see a UFO or you have some uh, extraordinary experience, well, your experience doesn't count. It's the experience of scientists in a lab where it's third-person corroborated and all of that kind. Their experience counts, but your experience, give me a break. And so now it's only certain types of experience are counted as legitimate experience, just as in 16th century. There were, apparently, medieval scholastic philosophers who refused to look through Galileo's telescope because they were sure if they saw anything that was incompatible with Aristotelian astronomy, Aristotelian physics, if anything they observed didn't conform to Aristotle, then it must be false. It must be an aberration of the lenses. It must be an artifact of the system of measurement. And therefore, we don't need to look. Because if we look and find something that is in accordance with Aristotle, then ho-hum, we already knew that. If we see something that is not in accordance with Aristotle, can't possibly be true. So we have two reasons for not having to look through the telescope. <laughs> Thank goodness they didn't win. <laughs> Principles of scientism. This is a creed. It's a dogma. It's a belief system. It may actually be true. I don't know. But it does have certain tenets, and we can trace these back to the mid-19th century. Among many people, here's simply one, Auguste Comte. Here's how he put it. They called it positivism back then. It's called scientific materialism. It's called materialistic monism. It's called by many names. Ah, but one is scientism as more the more fundamentalist branch. Here, the basic tenets. Science is our only source of genuine knowledge about the world. Does that sound familiar? The Bible is the only authentic word of God. I mean, I mean the, the Koran. No, I meant the Bhagavad Gita. No, I mean the Tao Te Ching. No, I meant the, ba the, the Buddhist canon. Or Mary Baker Eddy. I mean, somebody must have the only way. This is a big deal in the West. We seem to be very keen on people having the only way. I guess it gives, it's kind of like Linus and a security blanket. If I've got the only way, that, that really gives me assurance. And it gives me the assurance you're really wrong. I suppose there's some comfort in that. 
But I can understand, I can actually, as much as I think this is absurd, I can also be sympathetic to it. Because if we look at the late 19th century, what other discipline in academia, in terms of understanding the natural world, not simply human, for, uh, human customs and so forth, human history and so forth, but in terms of understanding nature, what other discipline had come to consensual knowledge and had made such progress and had all these wonderful perks coming out of locomotives you know, and wristwatches and all these kind of things, technology? Where was there a success story like that of modern science from the time of Galileo till the time of let's say, James Crook Max- Maxwell in the 1880s and so forth, 1870s? Where was there a success story that was comparable to that, where from generation to generation it was clear they were learning more, they agreed, they would perform new hypotheses, put them to the test, and agree, and agree, and agree, and it was just so juicy. It worked so well. Who was doing anything like that? The theologians? Not by a long shot. Theologians of what kind? Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, or Lutheran, or Pentecostal? And let us not even talk about the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians and the Buddhists and the Hindus and Taoists and so forth. Where's the consensus? Where were they growing in a body of knowledge and coming to consensus? Nowhere in sight. In fact, especially with Christianity, they seem to be running, running backwards, moving away from the, this inexorable movement of science, pushing back the history of a planet from 7,000 years to, oh, some hundreds of millions, they thought back then, the relative motion of the earth and the sun, and so on, theology seemed to be going into a defensive mode and losing the battle, frankly. And but not making any great gains itself. It was just basically retracting. Philosophy, where was there any consensus among 19th century philosophers? William James to Schopenhauer to Josiah Royce, and the list goes on and on. Where do they really agree on anything? Unless it just happened to be by accident. And what what can you point to in terms of the development of of philosophy that says, oh, in the 19th century they believe this, but now in the 20th century they've got this great consensus. I wish, but I don't see it now either. It's not to say philosophy is a waste of time, and nor am I implying that theology is a waste of time. But for those who are pretty skeptical, they might say, We've got these three major disciplines. Clearly there are others as well, but science is the one that's really working. It's the so why should we not conclude it's the only source of genuine knowledge about our world? Because it seems to be the only one that works. Science, says Comte, it is the only way to understand humanity's place in the world. So not only just the environment, but how do we fit in? By this time, Darwin had come up with his magnificent theory. 1859 was when that came out. So, aha, that's how we fit in. We're not sui generis. We're not in a, ca- a category all by ourselves, separate from all of creation, to, just plunked down on the sixth day, but there was this course of evolution over hundreds of millions or perhaps even billions of years. That's where we fit in. And it was science that revealed that, not theology or philosophy. And therefore, science provides the only credible view of the world as a whole. So it's the only methodology. It shows where we fit in, and in terms of its conclusions, rely on science, because that's the only one that's credible. Where's the consensus in any other field? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I think it's fundamentally wrong, but it's... It sounds good. But now what is this world, this world that is being understood, this natural world? Emphasis on natural. It consists, according to this view, only of physical phenomena that can be explained according to the laws of physics and biology, and there are no non-physical influences in the physical world. That's really the gist of it right there. I see this in the media all the time nowadays. This is not some kind of artifact from the 19th century some relic that we pick out of somebody's grave. This is in the New York Times science section, you know, last week, or Time magazine, or many scientific journals. If one does not embrace that assertion right there, the words start coming out. I see them as almost like mantras. Magical thinking, supernatural thinking, irrational thinking, mystical thinking. You either accept this, or you're just bloody stupid, or ignorant, or you've fallen into supernatural, magical thinking. It's kind of just more insulting than anything else. Like, come on, this is what's going on. 